So it is. Um, um, I would quote a Latin phrase, except I, I have uh, imperfect recollection. Of it. So I'll still spare that for another time. Um, um, so um, when I'm looking for test cases, I'm looking for specifics, but it's principles that motivate those test cases that are the focus of our discussion today. Don't lose track of the fact though, that the test cases themselves are concrete. They have specific inputs and we expect specific outputs for those. And generally I'd look for someone to say some motivation for the test case to, to remind ourselves why we're choosing this test case, right? Right. Um, so we started this discussion and we did so noting that these principles carry um, across the spectrum of test cases from black box to white box or glass box um, across uh, automated tests and manual tests uh, across um, you know UI based testing through the GUI versus programmatic testing that drives the system by calls to APIs and across sort of levels of testing from unit test to integration test to system test, where you might be testing use cases, user stories, all the way up to acceptance tests. The principles here cut across these. They have specific twists to them that are often different at a unit test level or a system test level or for white box or glass box versus black box, but they carry across. Okay, um, and we had discussed some, some what I call techniques or, or principles. And the main one we talked about back in the day from the state was equivalence partition. Um, and does anyone remember the basic gist of equivalence partition, finding equivalence classes when testing your code? Uh, yes, Matthew. That's right. So they share some general feature often. Maybe they all elicit the same error message, right? Or maybe they all represent a certain class of valid inputs. They're all representative of that um, that should undertake a certain action that should lead to a certain action to be undertaken. Um, they should be handled in the same basic way. They should yield the same observable behavior, perhaps. Um, uh, they should exercise the same basic logic in the code, right? Um, and we talked about some ideas for that. And, and you know, I gave you some challenges with this, like where you count the number of occurrences of a strum string of one one string or another. We try to find uh, find occurrences of the substring. And we sort of articulated classes of inputs here that were that had kind of similar logic for what they're testing. And we reflected on the fact that, you know, in as much as we want to check the correct behavior of the system under different logical situations, it behooves us. It, it is sensible and desirable to marshal our limited testing resources, to focus in on each of these equivalence classes for a couple examples, but to not waste, to not fritter away our time doing many, many examples of a given equivalence class because that those choices have opportunity cost. Remind me of the notion of opportunity cost. Yes, Jesse. Yes, by choosing X, by choosing to put my efforts into testing tons and tons of examples of this equivalence class, it is inevitable given the shortages of time and expertise, you know, um, 
uh, the working of uh, time for the testers and so on, they're going to be not testing some other things. You want the greatest bang for your buck, right? It's penny wise pound foolish if you invest in A because it offers some benefit, but it foregoes greater value by testing B, C, and D. So if we're going to limit, if we're going to marshal our limited testing time, we should put it in the things that yield the greatest bang for the buck, yield the greatest gain. And it makes sense to at least test a few things with any equivalence class, but to move between equivalence classes to make sure this logical situation works, that make sure the code handles this other logical situation, this other logical situation, this other case, this type of error, that type of error, this type of correct case, that type of correct case, so that we make sure the the system is running correctly or handling errors correctly for a wide variety of circumstances. Does that make sense? Okay, so this is part of our choice as testers. We don't just flail against the system. Don't flail, ladies and gentlemen. Flailing is generally not an effective technique. Put your efforts in the things that matter. And part of that is choosing, think about equivalence classes and making sure you test at least a few things in each equivalence class. We talked about the example for a plane, you know, reserving seats on a plane, right? You want to test, it was some cases of window seats, of aisle seats, of middle seats, seats in the first class cabin. Um, and you want to test, of course, different things where that seat is already occupied. Can you select it, right? Um, or uh, where no such seat exists, is it going to propose it, et cetera? Um, and so we thought about equivalence classes. But I want to build on, and I gave some examples of this, but I want to give you some additional principles um, that are related to this. And that is, um, right, uh, boundary value testing. The idea of testing around the boundaries of these equivalence classes. Because there's picking a few examples from an equivalence but I would argue within an equivalence class or within a broad set of things that are handled should be handled the same logic, yield the same error messages, elicit the same observable behavior, have the same logic associated with them, should be dealt with by the same branches of the but certain paths in the code. I would argue that it's often the boundaries between those equivalence classes where a lot of errors occur. Why is that? Can anyone say? Why do I say like boundaries are where a lot of errors occur? Yes, Erdogan, so speak on. It's where edge cases. It's where edge cases. Almost by definition that those give the edge cases. There are things that someone could be excused for thinking should be handled one way where really it's, it's understandable because it's right at the edge, but really it should be handled the other. So if we had age, if we had a form where someone was filling in their age um, uh, for, you know, access for uh, a, a driver's license, for example, what might be a boundary case for availability of that driver's license in Saskatchewan? Uh, yes, Danny. That's right, the minimum age they can't drive. And I'm not gonna get into the rules for driving farm equipment and, <laughs> and, and various things like that, but the minimum age that, that applies. And, and the key thing is someone could be told like, you know, you can't drive before you're 16 on the, you know, a general vehicle or something. And, and it's kind of ambiguous in English sometimes what that means, right? Before you're, okay, at 16, can I drive or can I not drive, right? Um, sometimes uh, these rules can lead to mistakes. And in software development, we have a lot of mistakes that are what I would call off by one errors. What is an off by one error? Can anyone say? Uh, uh, let's just see if we could get someone else uh, besides Ardalan. I welcome you. Um, someone else besides Ardalan and Jesse, Avi, yeah. 
for some reason during the program. Yeah. <clears throat> sure. You added a that's right. That's right. You might put in, it might be as simple as you put in, is the age greater than 16 rather than is the age greater than or equal to 16? Mm -hmm. um, Ardalan, yes. The HKC is like, do they have a valid visa? Okay. So, so that's, that may, be a you're absolutely right a context that would limit their ability to draw it, for example uh and that it might be that the rule is generally if you're 16 or older but you you what you, i think the point you're bringing is if you look more broadly than that that only applies for certain classes of individuals that's true that's true and and I mean, it's it's also true for certain other um, considerations, right? If if someone's legally blind, they're they're not come, going to be allowed to drive, even when they're sixteen or older. But with respect to kind of edge cases, this issue of boundaries, this issue of off by one errors that often lead to the boundaries, is distressingly common. How many people here have ever encountered off by one errors in their code? Yeah, like, yeah, exactly. Um, and for those who didn't have their hands raised, either my hat is off to you or maybe you should think a little bit <laughs> harder. Um, uh, it's very common. Um, now, boundary value testing works with equivalence classes. And in many cases, not all, you know, we have like ranges of values and we might have certain dividing areas, like when it's zero, and when it's one, and when it's greater than one, and there might be an equivalence class that you know handles all of these, and this is a boundary between equivalence classes, and you know now there's an equivalence class that handles these or something along those lines, or these equivalence classes might might you know border up here with this one, including zero. Um, I don't know if this is going to be captured well enough in the video, uh, but but we want to make sure this one is handled properly of one and of zero, et cetera. Uh, so often we have kind of equivalence classes in some range, and we want to make sure the ones, the areas between them are correctly handled because implementation wise, it can be as simple as greater than rather than greater than equal to. But also in terms of the explanation or uh, design, ambiguities can come in there when you're getting requirements from your stakeholder, right? Um, you say, what's the last day someone has the survey issued to them? And maybe your stakeholder, or maybe, maybe you ask, you know, when should they stop receiving the survey? And Dr. App says, you know, uh, uh, they should stop receiving it on you know, July, uh, you know, July 1st. And then the question is, okay, so that's the day, is that the last day they receive it? Or is that the first day they don't receive it, right? Um, off, again, often English is imperfect for this. Okay, so a challenge here. Suppose there's a web form in which case users could enter their integer age um, as part of a, of a form. What are some boundary values that might apply here? We talked before about actually this case when we had equivalence classes. Um, I'm being vague here as to the application, whether it's, you know, I'm not saying it's car insurance necessarily, um, just more more general. Yes, Erdogan. Negative, no, negative, no. So, or actually, Pink. or one thing that they can do, I mean, similar to the system is having it possible. Okay. I'm not sure if, like, because I know that's in your discussion, sometimes this is your first year on the English instruction. Right. Okay. So, th those are good comments for equivalence classes. Like, there's a set of inputs that share the feature that they're a correct number, but they have a plus in front of them, plus 10, right? Plus one. Um, uh, but, um, Right now we're dealing with the, we're, with boundary values, things that lie between equivalence classes. So Babs, yeah. Um, 
Yeah. So 18 might be a, a good one because it's the age of majority, right? It's the age which someone has legal agency to to undertake a lot of uh, choices uh, in life. Yes, Abby. Um, yeah. So there'd be a maximum. You want to check that maximum and make sure that the maximum allowed value is, in fact, accepted rather than being rejected, right? Because again, a programmer may have been told um, it should go from zero to 99, um, and they assume zero is to be handled and 99 to be handled. Um, whereas, you know, conceivably, um, uh, the, the person who was telling this, um, you know, actually meant for those to be excluded. That's sometimes why when we write in English, up to and including is, imper is important terminology. I've seen these so many times, even outside the programming context, that you know when I write text, I generally try to be very careful about saying up to and including. Right? I'm on vacation till till you know the last day of class. Okay, it has some significance. Am I on vacation on the last day of class or just um? Up to, but not including. And English is again uh, confusing. Juan, yes. Um, what about zero as the boundary between good positive and negative? Exactly. Exactly. So clearly, it should reject negative. Zero is something that you should think about, right? Like, is that is that okay? And you want to make sure it handles it, whatever the design of the system uh, allows. Jesse, yes. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So the minimum itself, maybe minus one, maybe maximum, maximum plus one. Why would you do like maximum plus one or minimum minus one? Because you want to be sure what? That it handles incorrect values as well. It handles some correct, right? Um, oh, sorry, that, that, that sounds weird. You want to make sure that it handles incorrect values correctly. But the point is, it should handle illegal values correctly. Should we throw an exception if the user enters the maximum plus one? Is that a good way to handle it? No. Why is it not a good way? Yeah, an, an exception is the signal that a programmer's assumption about the logic of their code is, is, is wrong, right? They're writing code and they assume that this array is sorted, or they assume this array is at least one element in it, or they assume this linked list is in a sorted order, uh, or they assume it's not null, this thing giving them. You know, it, it has to do with programmer assumptions. Um, and you can't use it to enforce what user end users like of a system in a web form are filling in. You can't say like, you're out of luck, buddy. You know, <laughs> we'll, we'll just have an assertion failure, right? Um, you enter your name, like you don't have a middle name. I'm out. You're out of here. You know, um, assertion failure. You can't do that. You can't use it to signal illegal user input. You can't say you're invalid to a user. You have to provide some sort of guidance to them. You can't handle it as a as an assertion of failure, you have to provide them a meaningful error message so they can correct it. Um, I think we've all been in experience of systems that haven't always been so kind. Yes, Juan. Oh, sorry. Yes, Ardila. So the there are some areas that you don't put in like your boundary sometimes. Correct. The system will give you uh, the output, but it's not an output that probably the user is going to understand. So in those cases, mm -hmm. how can you make those outputs in a way that when they those happen, then in those cases that you don't understand it, mm -hmm. that they, you don't predict it for those, the user can still have an idea what the hell is going on. So, so are you saying that... Um, so, for, so are these illegal cases? Yeah, illegal cases that we never found and or never thought about, but it might happen. And well, the user might get some uh, output that you know does or might not understand. So how can well, you turn that kind of output in a way that predicts? Yeah, I mean, in general, you try to identify properties, sort of criteria, conditions that are going to distinguish 
um, illegal from legal cases. Um, and those criteria may be very different in different contexts. I mean, for names, um, it may be actually uh, quite quite involved to figure out what's an acceptable name or not, right? Um, uh, you know, is it a legitimate name, right? Um, uh, the world's languages are diverse, even those that might render into uh, Latin characters um, uh, you know, I've seen in my time question marks as part of names, exclamation points as part of names, um, uh, names that are one word for the name. You know, I had a, when I was in grad school, there was a professor who, who had one name. His, he, he didn't have a separate surname and given name. There was just one name. Um, there's, of course, I mean, I'll, I'll say, of course, to people here, but maybe there's people in the room who aren't aware that, you know, uh, there are many names, real names that have apostrophes in them, right? Um, uh, there's people who write their name all in lowercase. Um, uh, there's names that, you know, have hyphens, right? Um there's cases where people have multiple middle names, right? There's cases, actually, this is an important thing. You know, uh, if I, I remember when I was uh, yet a young man and the, the world was cooling and we were smashing rocks after work, um, you know, uh, we were dealing with the fact for the first time that realization that our code had to run globally, right? The code I was writing professionally, needed to run in diverse countries around the world. And there's this whole focus on internationalization of your code. And, and that required coming out of certain fixed assumptions about, about things and using terminology that carries over between cultures. For example, first name, last name, in, in a context of Canada, will generally be taken to mean first name means given name, last name means surname or family name. But if you look worldwide, there's many cultures where your last name comes first. Your, sorry, your family name is written first and then your given name, right? Um, um, and uh, you have to be prepared in language for that. Um, so, my point is, even the area of names, like you're right that it's the criteria you're using are rather textured, right? Um, it's not like the square root function where you can write down neatly these in, you know, these inputs should uh, be illegal for it. These these inputs um, should be legal, and there's a neat boundary. Sometimes it's not quite that. It's not that clean, but you could still define criteria that are definitely legal, definitely illegal, um, that you can check. And uh, you can associate those criteria with different error messages. If it's illegal, it's illegal because of X, you know. And um, uh, you can use those error messages to give feedback to a user. So criteria, properties that the input has to match that are associated with a so, uh, with kind of comments or verbiage are really an important tool. I don't know if that's helpful, but th that'll be one thing I say. Okay. Um, um, okay. So suppose th that in a smartphone app, you know, created uh, po some popular smartphone apps, suppose there's a name field or description fields into the, so the user can enter a title for a journal entry. What are some boundary, well, what are some equivalence classes that you want to check? These ones, these ones, these ones for this. What are what would be some equivalence classes at first? And then I'll get you to think about the boundary. So so someone has a journal entry in the app, maybe it has some photos and, and other text. And they have to, and, and they can enter a description for it. it. Expects a description for it. What would be some things you'd want to check? Yes, I'm happy. Ambiguity. 
Yeah, an empty field would be a good one. What's something else? You know, just, yeah, some something that pushes the character limit. Maybe uh, that that would be a good thing. We'll come back to that for boundary objects. Yes, Abby. Um, some special characters that might break stuff on the back. Good, good. Yeah. So, you know, hopefully it's not ampersand, but uh, you know, backslashes or or something along those lines. Maybe some SQL code with you know dash dash um, uh, to, to as a comment character, and then some um, some SQL code so that it would serve to somehow mask out um, the original code in the database and, and insert some other code instead. Um, yeah, what would be some boundary value for this? So so for that case of maximum what might be a good boundary value to try um yeah so Abby. only spaces okay uh, uh, only spaces would be um so that might be a equivalent class right because there could be one space two spaces three spaces etc but what are some boundary values i i like jesse's idea so there's some maximum number of characters right um and there's a minimum number of characters what are some boundary values uh yes princess yeah, yeah, max. Yeah, max input length itself, and then max input length plus one. Max input length should be handled right correctly. It should be accepted, right? Max input length plus one should not be right. Um. Uh, good. By the way, uh, there are some programming conventions where we actually use in the variable names. We use descriptive variable names that use words like limit compared to max, where max is a value that it can be handled. Limit is the value just above that. It's like just beyond the max. And it implies that it's not handled, but it's one beyond. Um, this is a, a good way to remind programmers not to just use max to mean to be kind of fuzzy. Does it get handled or does it not? Right. Um, or limit to be, does it get handled or does it not? It'll be a better example. Yeah, so um, that's right. So another one would be an empty one. You know, that's that's a a boundary uh, value for it. What would be another one though? Yes. What well, makes sense about minus one? Like my minimum value minus one. Okay, but- uh, Sometimes maybe the, the system counts. Yeah, it, it's hard to enter. I mean, I don't want to diminish it, but for this case, it's hard to enter a negative blank string. Um, so, so this is a this is like a string you have to enter. So you you're, you're generally physically prevented from entering a negative blank string. But what's what's another kind of one that that's kind of at the boundary? How about a how about a string that has? Sorry. Uh, okay. I mean, numbers. Yeah, you get a the number. Sure, sure. It's kind of an equivalence class, I think. But I was thinking one character, right? Does it handle? It should handle a description length with just one character. A description with one character, right? Um. Yes, that, uh, Daniel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and uh, it was mentioned before, like non-white space characters or 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 blanks but there's actually other white space characters beyond blanks what's a white space character beyond beyond a uh, space tab tab yeah there's so okay i don't let me get ranting about it don't tell me it's still around oh no oh my gosh um yeah, I don't want to relive old trauma, okay? Um, but there are some cases where it can be really picky really persnickety, obnoxiously so in handling differently things that are visually the same when it's tabs versus spaces. Please don't tell me your generation has been exposed to that trauma. A lot. I am... I, I, I'm exercising great willpower to avoid uttering 
making vocalizations that are unfit for recording. Um, I'm sorry that you went through that trauma. You know, that should have been buried long ago. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, I think you realize the gravity of, of the uh, obnoxiousness of it. Um, don't perpetuate that obnoxiousness on for future generations, please. Make me that promise. And the software you write, please do not make people cry by being unable to distinguish visually correct input from incorrect input with a stupid thing like different types of white space. Okay. Um, uh, take it from an old man. Um, okay. Uh, suppose there's a login field uh, where the user can enter their email address. What's a boundary value for this? What's a good boundary value? So we talked about equivalence classes, things that are and are not legal email addresses, a boundary value. Mm. Please. Yeah. So I want this like the user, uh, for, uh, not the user price for the number one, but the progress that the dollars at the like, digital dot com. Yeah. Kind of, uh, it's not the exact boundary, but it's kind of. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I was thinking like, uh, so, so uh, I, look, that is a good thing to check. I, I don't want to get too caught up because the notion of boundary value when we don't have a kind of linearly ordered set of things can get, or, or some sort of space of possibilities that's well-defined can get a bit murky. And I don't want to get caught up in that. But this is all about being sensible and checking things that might have mistakes. And what you mentioned is absolutely something we want to check. So I don't want, I don't want to get, you know, picking whether is it a boundary object or not, but it is it is something we want to check. Jesse, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. So some, you, can, you do the absolute minimum that you can do legally, right? So maybe it's A at B dot C or something like that, right? Um, and see if it properly handles it, right? Um, so so that would be indeed, you know, an important one to check because it should handle it. And if it doesn't, it's probably a sign of some sort of off by one error, or, you know, some sort of silly thing. Um, except, I, I suppose we have extract substring. So we have a, String, and we specify how many characters input starting at zero. Um, uh, you you start for the start of the string, the first character of the string you want to extract uh, from this. Um, you want to excerpt from it, and final is the last character within that string you want to extract, and it starts at zero. What would be some boundary values here? What would be some boundary values for, or boundary cases for, for when you call this, uh, this string. Give me, give me some that would probably be reasonably regarded as sort of boundary. Um, um uh, 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 Ralph? Yeah. I guess like checking for, you know, you sign the starting object is pretty similar. It's the one, the one, the one, the one, the one, the one. Like if you're starting the one first time, the yeah. first time, the first time. Yeah, yeah. So where these two are equal would be a good one, right? Um, where where start equals final. What's another one that's kind of close to that, but should be an error? Yes, Matthew. Final. Final is equal to the string length would be a problem because the maximum value should be. If it's starting from zero, it should be string like minus one, right? Um, okay, An another one which is close, but it's as they would sometimes say, no cigar. Um, yes, uh, name? Nick Sard. Yes, I'm sorry. I should have had my glasses on. Just an empty string. Yeah, an empty string would be pretty serious boundary, right? Um, and is that a specific, so so that's true. Is it a complete test case? I, mean, I just want to make sure that, I think you know the answer, but I want to make sure that the rest of the class falls off. Is 
an empty string, a complete test case, what else would we need to specify? Start in the final, right? And, and what, um, this is an interesting question, right? What values of start and final should be legit for an empty string? Zero, zero. there are none because there are, it's kind of telling it, hey, take the first value from this, and, the, and, and that's the same, take the first value and the first value alone by setting them equal to zero, but there ain't no value there. There ain't no value there, right? Um, and so you, you're not gonna be able to extract it and and you didn't need to check this, you know, um, uh, uh, here um, extracts the substring starting there and start at and up to and including, note the, the expression here, final, where final is greater than or equal to start and both start and final need to lie within the bounds of the string. Um, you notice that final needs to be less than string length. So if string length is zero, Final needs to be no more than one, minus one. Um, and notice it says the function does not support negative indices. So if we give it an empty string, what can, can we call it and expect anything but an error condition? Not, not by this, it actually would be an error condition. Um, you know, it, one or the other, right? It, it's going to complain, particularly. You know, you would need start equal final be minus one, and that's going to violate that rule about they cannot be the negative, right? Um, there will be another boundary, plausible boundary case though for this. And I see a hand up back there, and is that Tony? Yes. Yes. Uh, final equals star plus one. Final equals star plus one. Okay. Yes. Exactly. So, so you. How many values should you get extracted from the string? Assuming the string is long enough, how many, how long should the extracted string be? Uh, if final equals start plus one? Uh, it, it, it's not error. Final equals start plus one. In my mind, if the string is, what's the minimum length string that should work for? Right. Um, um, so, so, right. Here's start. Here's final. Final equals start plus one. Um, and particularly, I'll use start zero, final one, and my string will be no, oh, which is. My initials. Um. Yes. Okay. Yes. So how about we have this string, but it starts with an empty string, like with an empty actual character. So does that does do still count that tab or space or whatever it is here? That, whatever. I'm not aware of an empty character. I think there are characters that don't appear visually. Yeah. But I don't think there's an empty. There's not a character that doesn't count as a character. That, like, that would be like the symbol in little included there or not because I know that sometimes the system will just get rid of that empty space. Um, I know that's all this. Yeah, I, I think we'll have to close. I'm glad to talk about this after, but but this is this is indeed a good boundary case. I would say there's even another boundary case, um, where uh, these two are involved, Tony. Yes. Ah, reverse it, yeah. Then, then it violates this condition, right? Um, so it's it's not less than or start is not less than or equal to final, right? Um, by the way, this rules out not good, right? Um, yes, me sorry. Final equals start. Final equals start is a boundary case, right? How many characters should be extracted if final equals start? Assuming there's enough characters in the string, one, right? Um, maybe think more about this. We're we're out of time, and your projects need tending to. The time is accountant. We'll continue this on Friday, but I'm going to ask you to watch a video, and uh, we will briefly talk about the contents of that video. 
And I hope you can enact those contents in your bug parties. So if you're going to do a bug party, try to watch the video before it, okay? Uh, if you're going to do a bug party before Thursday.